All right, that better? Okay. All right, sorry for starting a few minutes late. Um, this talk is called Cash in the Isles. It's on a gift card hacking. Um, this is about three years of research where um, I went into a store once, saw some gift cards out there, and then went down the rabbit hole of basically exploiting every gift card out there, um, restaurants, retail stores. Um, Wired, Art, uh, Wired Magazine picked this up. They did a story on it. And then the retailer started fixing all these holes, and then um, I started finding more ways of doing it. So you'll see, I'm going to walk you through pretty much every way you can exploit a card, and then new, new um, methods that are coming out up until like two days ago. Uh, uh, Cribs on security actually wrote another article on more ways you can uh, uh, steal a gift card. So um, here's some background on me. Um, <clears throat> I started my IT um, in, in the Marines, worked for uh, Ernst & Young when I got out, PwC, Build.com. I'm the founder of, one of the founders of Norcon Security Conference in Northern California, and uh, sec I do cons security consulting for Entity Security. All right, so the main thing people think when they see gift cards is that, you know, unactivated ones have no value. You walk into a store, they're sitting out there on a display. Um, there's not really any security to them because they're given away, they're free. They're expecting people just to buy them, put money on them, and walk out the door. Uh, there's a problem with that is that these cards are all mass produced by about three different companies, and there's a predictable pattern to all these cards. Um, there's no security on the cards. Well, there's some now, but it's still easily um, bypassed. Uh, no chip and pin, none, nothing like that. So what we're going to do here first is I'm going to walk you through you know, how you can find uh, vulnerable cards, determining valid from invalid cards uh, numbers uh, using Burp Intruder. If anybody's familiar with Burp Intruder, if you're not, it's just a proxy tool. It allows you to intercept the data while you're sending it back and forth. I'll show you exactly how these attacks can be done and how you can enumerate your own uh, valid cards. And then um, I brought my card writer with me. I'll show you how you can write card numbers to cards and then use them in stores. So this is quasi-illegal, but uh, it's research, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> um, so how does the attack work? Well, here we go. You go into uh, a restaurant um, or a fast food place. You'll see these cards sitting out front. You can grab a stack of them. So I would suggest grabbing six or so cards, flipping them over, and looking at the card numbers. Um, that's hard to see in here, but here are the card numbers that are on those cards. So I grabbed uh, three, six cards. Do you guys see a pattern to these cards? Yeah. All right. What, what is the pattern? Very low entropy. Low entropy, yes. Um, Twelfth octet increments by a single digit. Uh, that's the main thing we're going to look at here for this first attack is of this stack of cards, uh, octet 12 increments by one. Um, number 6-9 is missing. Someone might have grabbed that out of the stack because they you know, didn't want someone stealing their gift cards, so they might have just grabbed it. Um, but we see a pattern, right? So what, we can, what, what do we determine from this pattern? Earlier cards in the stack were either sold or taken by a customer, potential customer, and we can identify the starting and end points of those potential numbers. So basic subtraction here, we're going to increment and reverse or decrement down. So the cards that we have are 6-5 and 6-6 six, six on that 12th, or 11th and 12th octet. If we count backwards, 6-4, six, 6-3, six, 6-2, six, we know those cards are gone. They're part of the stack. They're valid um, in that th they exist. We don't know the last four digits, but how do we get those last four digits? First thing you want to do is you go to the website of the company that has these cards um, and you punch in that, that, that card number. So the card number on the left, um, it says to activate a card, you must load it with the minimum balance of one of our, our, one of our stores. So it says that that's a valid card, an invalid card. That card number or security code is invalid. Please check them and try again. So we've now identified a way to determine a valid card from an invalid card with or without money, doesn't matter. We just want to know which cards are valid, right? And we have our, our starting point, which is that 12th octet of that card with the missing last four digits. So using Burp, um, we can see the post request when we send a balance check uh, for a valid card. We send that number through. It's a nice um, response back here is um, error with gift card balance, um, status OK, and it tells you the card number that you sent. Now, if you send an invalid card, so you put 2222 two, two, two at the end of it, 
you get a different message back. Same thing as, as I showed you on that previous slide with the um, screenshots of the response back. So what they show you on the screen might not be the same as what they're showing you actually in the HTML. So we know what we can search for now based upon the responses. So Intruder is a nice little component of Burp Suite. This allows you to uh, automate attacks um, against uh, post requests, get requests, whatever. So we're going to go here. We're going to uh, send that post request for that valley card or any of those cards. And we're going to put our markers on the last two, uh, or at the end of the card number. So we have our 12th octet on there. And then we put our markers. Everybody following so far on that? All right, if you have questions later, just ask me afterwards. But um, we now, we're at that last octet. So our payload set is going to be numbers. Um, and we're going to do a sequential from 0001 to 9999 with a step of one, four digits, minimum, maximum. And that gives you an example of it's going to have four, di four, four numbers it's going to be guessing. And then we're going to grep match for that error response. Now there's other ones you can grep for later. I'll show you some more examples. Uh, on this example, we know that the error code is. So we can do a grep match for the error code saying the card number doesn't exist. And then we'll just do an inverse search on it and find the one that does. And so you'll run Burp Intruder. It'll go through. It'll try everything from 001 all the way to 9999. 10,000 guesses, roughly about 10 minutes of work. And then we'll find the one response that comes back with the valid uh, card number. I X out, obviously, the, the, the earlier digits because it didn't belong to me. Um, <laughs> And then it shows you the value of the money that's on that actual card. So that's, that's um, the first, first way of doing it. So then um, we're going to go over MagStrip um, fundamentals later. Like I'm going to cover exactly how the MagStrip works, how you can write to it. Um, just some um, basic overview of it, though. These are, there's um, different uh, tracks, different ways you can write to them. Raw ISO, AA, MVA, and California DMV. Um, high low cursivity. Um, the there's two diff different types of cards. Basically, there's a, a brown striped card and a black striped card. Um, some of newer credit cards have silver. The black and silver are more high end. They're used for uh, credit cards. Um, the brown ones are kind of disposable. You'll see those on like bus transits, like BART. Anything where you just print out a little paper card and it has a brown strip on it. There's also some gift cards that use brown as well. Um, yeah, so those, the high, high co and low co. We're going to be mainly be covering high co. I have uh, a low co card with me as well. It's in one of the examples. Uh, you'll probably be able to pick that one out because that one's uh, extremely easy to uh, brute force. Um, but we'll get to that. So what do we do? Um, we need to write cards. We need to be able to write these valid card numbers to a, uh, to a card so we can use them, right? Or we could uh, potentially use them, I should say. So you can go on Amazon, pick up one of these guys for about $70. Um, you then have a MagStrip reader writer, uh, and then it works with uh, all types of cards, credit cards, gift cards, um, any type of transit cards. Here's the uh, information on where you can get the software. I'm really just laying it out here for you, so it's pretty, <laughs> no, pretty easy. Um, so yeah, they have the, all the different types of drivers. You can use uh, there's Linux or Python-based, Windows-based ones, and then there's a programmer's manual. So I initially, when I went, went to this vendor, I found that valid card number. I wrote it down on a piece of paper, and I went in, and I said, I lost my card. And they punched it in, and they said, oh, you have money. You can use it. So I didn't need the physical card. So the safeguard they put in was like, we're going to require the physical card before anybody can like use a gift card, which makes sense. So then this is where the idea of like getting the writer comes in. So we get one of their cards from their store. Um, we swipe it. That is difficult to see. I can, I can barely see it from here. But the first track, so there's three tracks on a card. The first track has the card uh, number itself, the vendor, which I kind of blurred out and then discretionary data at the end of it. Second track is the card number and the discretionary data. I'll go into a lot more detail on the mag strip itself later, but what we need, all we really need, all we care about is the card number itself. So the card number is there. You can then just highlight the area you want to change, those last four digits and the 12th octet, and then write in the ones that are valid and then write the card. 
So I took that to them and I said, you know, this worked as well. So then they're like, well, now we just need to make sure the card number matches the card that they're swiping, which is, is good, but in practice, how many minimum age restaurant workers are going to waste their time validating the card number matches what they swipe? They're gonna swipe it and then say, oh, the computer says you have this much. So safeguards, so I went back to the vendor and other vendors and just said, here are some safeguards that you can implement to prevent these types of attacks. You can have a CAPTCHA on your balance checking website. You need to have a four digit PIN in addition to the, uh, the 16 digit card number and don't util utilize LUN's check checksum algorithm. So this attack, remember how I said earlier it's 10,000 guesses to find a valid credit card out of those, that last octet or the last four numbers? LUN's algorithm means is basically essentially they're using a algorithm that re re reduces this number of guesses to around a thousand. It follows a pattern. So if you have enough uh, cards, enough samplings of a, a certain card or a card manufacturer, you can then determine if they're using LUNs and then know those card values that are going to show up. And then you only have a thousand guesses. And like I said before, there's about three or four main players in the gift card industry. One of them uses LUNs. Um, one of them just, um, I'll get to that one later, but there is one that uses LUNs and there's a couple that don't. So you can either have 10,000 guesses, 1,000 guesses, or my, my last example, which you'll, I think you'll find funny as well, but I'll get to that one. All right, so here, here's the card. Um, I say until this year because there's been new attacks that have come out that kind of make these obsolete. One of the first slides I showed you was that um, gift cards are have to retain their value vendors have to take them so if i have a gift card from 2014 and it has no four digit pin on it it just has a card number they have to accept it so their balance checking website has to accept that number so you go to a balance checking website and it says enter your card number enter your pin if you have an old card that doesn't have a pin you don't have to enter a pin if they don't have a captcha on there you can brute force old cards you won't need to know the PIN number. So this PIN number is exposed. There was nothing covering it. Um, they implemented a CAPTCHA, um, and then they asked for your email address and phone. So that's, that's, that's a good safeguard. Um, this, this company, um, they have a little strip over the, uh, the PIN number. You notice the cards still follow the pattern, right? 8091, 8092, last four random, and then the PIN. So you'll need the PIN along with the card number to guess that. This one uses a, a five-digit random number. So they're incrementing by one, four, three, four, 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 five, and then there's a five-digit random number. So that's quite a few more. That's 100,000 guesses versus 10,000. Increases the, the size of your, of your brute force, but still possible. This one just blocks everything off. So you go and pick up a card. The card number's blocked out. The pin's blocked out. What they didn't realize is also, but the barcode matches the, the pin and the card number. <laughs> But you have to walk around with a little wand thing, right? And like shoot it to get the number. I guess you could do that or you could just take the cards, wand them, and then take it back. So security bypass, right? Nothing, you haven't done anything to the card, you've just scanned it, then you put them back. Nothing, doesn't look like it's been tampered with. All right. So this, this uh, is a coffee chain out in the West Coast. Um, you'll notice there, the 12th octet is the same. So they have multiple card numbers under that. So of the 10,000 guesses, you're gonna get a lot more card. You won't just get one correct response, you'll get multiple ones. They have a reg code, um, but if you go to their balance checking website, you put in your card number and it's wrong, it just says invalid card. If you put in a right one, it says what's your reg code? You guys see an issue here. You can enumerate valid cards because it'll say what's your reg code. So you won't know how much is on them because you don't have it, but you still have a valid card. So you can just write those out, walk in there with a stack and say, I think I have money on one of them. And they'll swipe them and they'll let you know. The, the reg code isn't used to check your balance or to retrieve your balance or to use it. It's just for validating on the site. So here's the burp intruder results. I did that, that brute force against it. Um, there's three valid cards in uh, that, in. In a, in a group. So of, of 10,000 possible cards, there's three per versus one per on the other ones. And here's what the mag strip looks like. It's the card number, the vendor, um, discretionary data, 
and on the track two, card number, discretionary data, track three, nothing. Doing it wrong, part two. Uh, this is a movie chain. What I found out is here is that these cards increment by one. So these are from different parts of the country. I picked them up, and but they all follow a pattern. So you can just brute force continuously through these and find them. You don't need to know the first 12 octets because it, all, it follows the exact same pattern all the way across. I think they started at, what, like 8 million or something and just went forward. So um, a lot of them don't have money, but once you punch the card number in, it gives you back a JSON response um, with the balance. You can then brute force it again, same, same method using Burp Intruder. You put in your two markers on the last four numbers and let it go. And you're going to flag for gift card balance equals or gift card balance colon because we know that's the response. And then it'll come back with whichever one has money on it. And you can just run it through continuously. You can start it on whatever number you want out of that sequence, walk away, come back a week later, and find the ones that have money on them. You notice there wasn't any CAPTCHA there either. So there's no, nothing stopping it. And they don't have any rate limiting or any of that in, uh, put in place. Guys, I just kind of, can you guys see that one? All right, what'd they do wrong? <laughs> so yeah, they incremented by a single digit. So um, if you can subtract, you can uh, basically, you grab a, a card, two cards from them, and you just write a card that has 84, 83, 82, 81 on it. Um, this is another restaurant. So one of those will have money on it. The cards are free to get. Uh, this is also a brown strip card. And I mentioned earlier, brown strip cards are those loco ones, the cheap disposable cards that cost no money to make and apparently no money to secure either. And this is another, another attack now is that instead of they're like covering the card numbers. They put them behind the counter, put them wherever. You can peel it back and see the card number, take a picture of it, wait till somebody sells it or someone buys it, and just check online periodically to see if money's been put on it. So that's another safeguard that they attempted to do. Uh, so just recapping, CAPTCHA, um, hidden random four-digit pin in addition to the card number. Don't increment by a single digit. Uh, validate the card number matches the physical card and ensure the protective sticker isn't tampered with. So there's that protective sticker I showed you on a few of them uh, earlier. And I said, I said, you know, these were secure up until this year. Well, they now have this method of you can look at these cards. You can tell that someone's been tampering with them. It did just look a little, little torn, torn up, a little messed up. Maybe someone scraped it off and then either placed the seal back on or put a new seal back on it. Well, sure enough, you can buy the seals on Amazon for a hundred for nine bucks. So you go to the store, you grab a gift card. I would recommend walking out of the store with them because they're free, scratching them off, taking a picture of the numbers, using these to stick them back on, going back in, place the gift cards back in their stack, and then going home, waiting online for someone to put activate them. You know the pin, you know the card number, you don't have to brute force anything, you just, you just wait, theoretically. The other thing is some people just took their balance checking offline. So this company just said, you know, screw it. We're just going to make you call into our 1-800 number. Um, obviously, that's a little more involved because then you have to read them the number. Um, if you're brute forcing, you can't do that. So seeing convenience, you know, requires them to actually have a person involved to do balance checks. Um, but, you know, it's a effective safeguard method. It's like not patching your systems, but you just unplug it. You know, both work. Both work. <laughs> So what if you're really, really lazy, though, all right? So like you don't want to go in the store, take a picture of a card, steal a card, or, you know, it brute force anything. You just want everything handed to you. So here's a website you can go to where people trade gift cards. They actually sell them. I don't, I mean, I collected comic books. I never got into the gift card collecting market. But there's 35,000 gift cards on there, and people are like, I have this one from... Uh, Chick-fil-A, uh, it's a 2015, there's no money on it, but people might want to buy it. It's a Christmas edition, right? So someone will offer like 50 cents for it, and the guy will sell his gift card. But he, on the back there, shows his card number. There's no money on it, right, mind you, but you know the pattern now, right? So recapping a little bit, 
if this is a 2014, 2015 um, collector's edition Chick-fil-A gift card, it's not going to have a pin number on it because I didn't implement it at that time. So if you put it into the website, you don't need it, but you also have a card number. So if you're going to brute force, you start brute forcing at the 12th octet as we did in method one. Um, this is just an example. I did not do anything with Chick-fil-A. Um, so it's just up there as an example. So, but if you go to that website, like I said, there's 35,000 different cards and different companies and anyone you want to target, you can just plug in their name. They'll show you the card number. It'll show you the vendor and then you can go to their website, see if they have a CAPTCHA. If they don't, just game on. Uh, this one was like, you know, we're going to put a CAPTCHA on our website and it'll prevent people from brute forcing it. And then I go into burp and just turn off JavaScript and uh, the CAPTCHA went away. <laughs> So, <laughs> nice little magic trick there, yeah. Um, so don't underestimate the uh, just disabling Java. So it's 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 pretty cool. Um, so that previous one, yeah, I, I won't tell you the name of that particular restaurant, but they, if you, when I was looking at the the balance on it, or was looking at that uh, removing the JavaScript, it went to this website. So I removed the host and just did a Google search of it. And every company that uses that method of gift card balance checking started showing up. So there's multiple ones. Um, I, I didn't obfuscate them. I don't feel I need to. Um, but American Girl, um, there's another one for Blooming Brands, uh, Corporate Box Office, uh, Outback Steakhouse. So those are a few. That's just four of the 50 or so that showed up on the page. And they all use the same back end. So if that X white worked on one, it'll work theoretically on all of these. And responsible disclosure has been done, so I'm um, just showing you an example that's been patched. So the back home, there's this uh, another company, the another brown strip card, go figure. The cards, they sell them, you put money on them for the steakhouse, and then they recycle them. So once you use it, they keep it, and then they sell it to another customer and reload it in the store. Uh, you go there enough times, you find out that these cards obviously recycle to the point where you will get the same card again. So if you buy enough gift cards, eventually you're going to hit a winning one. But what's also important here is also the name of the company that makes them. So Aloha eCard. Uh, if you just go to their website, it'll tell you all the companies that use them. So all these recycled brown strip cards, you can then go and look up all the other companies that use them. I mean, it's, it's helpful when they hand it all to you, right? Just So if you have like a regional company or store and you're like, hey, this one's exploitable. I found this huge vulnerability in it. I wonder who else, you know, is vulnerable to it. They map it out for you. All of them do. They'll just say, hey, these are all our companies. Or you go to their website and you'll see a certain search functionality on it. Um, you just basically say, okay, what other companies use this search functionality? And it'll, it just, just displays them to you. The other thing, um, instead of just getting free food, you can also get money. So uh, these certain these states require gift cards to be redeemed for cash. So you you found one that has forty dollars on it. You write it to a blank card or write it to an unused card that they that they have. You can then walk in and say, I want to just get my cash out on this, and they'll they'll cash you out. So there's a financial incentive as well um, f for doing this. This one's still valid, and I put it right at the end as I just want to give you guys a really cool example. Um, you can get really good with your um, greps. So instead of just grepping for uh, balance colon something or error in gift card value and then searching for that, uh, you can get really specific. This one has about 40 or 50 per last four, four digits, and then all the values uh, of how much is on it. Now you're thinking, well, I don't want to steal from somebody, which is a, a very good, you know, a very noble thing. You don't want to rip someone off that went and bought a gift card. But would you feel so bad if you knew that these were in 2014? They tell you the last time it was used. So I, this, I just found this like in a couple, not too long ago. And all these cards, there's I think about a thousand of them that are valid from 2014 for this restaurant that have full value or partial value on them. What is your first guess? A card from 2014, what happened to it? Or they threw it away, or they just don't care. Where does that money go? The company gets it. 
Yep. So that's it's they write it to their bottom line. They basically say about they average about 15 to 20 percent of gift cards are never used, and about 40 percent don't use their full value. So that previous slide, there's $25, and then there's like 9, 15, 9, whatever. They use part of it, and then they threw it out. So the company gets to keep that money. So if you're anti-corporate, you know it's your responsibility to go out. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But it's uh, there's an example there, and, and if you want to talk afterwards, I can I can point you to like how you can find this stuff. But um, a lot of them they still haven't patched it. They've been notified, and honestly, if you're a restaurant and your IT budget isn't isn't you know that well off, do you patch something like this? I mean, who's losing out? Is a company losing out? I mean, you go in there, your card, you had 25 bucks on it, grandma got it for your birthday or whatever, and now it's zero, or it's like $9, do you, what do you do? Who do you complain to? I had 25 on here, they're like, uh-huh, sure you did, you know, right? You're at Taco Bell, like, yeah, you probably got, you know, got high, went and used it, forgot, or whatever. They're not going to believe you. The, the, the burden of proof is on you to say, I did not use this card. So they might say, fine, we'll give you, you know, another $25 gift card. Or they might just look at you and say, I don't believe you. Or you could call their corporate headquarters and they could say, I don't believe you. I mean, there's different things you can do. Um, I actually had someone contact me after that Wired article and it was an elderly lady and she was emailing me and she was just like, I, you know, this happened to me. I had this card and it got stolen or something happened and they wouldn't give me any money back. So. Um, she CC'd me the email to the company. I wrote the company, linked the article, told them I was, you know, a researcher, and that, you know, it's it's more the highly unlikely that a seventy-something-year-old woman is into gift card fraud, um, and they kind of agreed with me. So she got her she got her money back. Um, but the, it was the exact same thing. She got a card off the rack. Um, she mailed it to her son, and then her son said there was nothing nothing on it. And she went back to the store, and they said, uh, yeah, somebody used it. And they thought she did, and obviously not. So, the other thing you can do is, um, if you want to cash these out, is go to a Coinstar now. Um, Coinstars take gift cards, so you don't even have to pass the uh, physical test of the card number matching the card on the mag strip or even the brand. You could write a Macy's to a to a Coles or a you know In and Out to a Whataburger. Nobody got that. Okay, <laughs> In and Out's better. Um, so. You can write the wrong card value, the wrong card name to a card of a different vendor, put it into a Coinstar, they read it, and, like, and they'll do a check on it, and they'll be like, oh yeah, it's got money, and they'll offer you a percentage of it. Uh, other gift card places also do percentage. You can uh, go to this websites and say, I have a card number, here's my PIN, uh, here's the balance, and this is what I want to sell it for. They'll go and validate it, because you gave them the PIN, so they'll take that information, send it through, and then validate that your current value is correct and what you're asking for it and determine if someone wants to buy it from you. All right, so mag strips. This is the, the, the last part of this. Uh, I wish that was, screen was a little larger, but um, we're going to go over how a mag strip works, what the tracks hold. So this is one of the swipes. Remember the card number, the vendor, and then discretionary data. Track one is seven bit alpha encoded. So 64 different characters are allowed on track one. 79 of them are stored. Track two um, is binary uh, data encoded. Um, 16 different characters, 40 are stored. So you, you can only have 16 special or characters on there. So um, what I'm getting at, you'll see. Uh, every card follows this pattern. There's a start sentinel and format code, so percent B. So percent B is the start sentinel, then the card number it follows it. Field separator, after your card number, the, the, card, uh, the name or vendor, some of them don't use it. As you saw in some examples, it was just a card number discretionary data. This one used it, and whatever that is. So there could be some regional encoding they put on there to say this group of cards was mailed to the West Coast, and we track this for knowing where more of our cards are used. I found out if you just delete it and write a card, it still works. So it doesn't, it doesn't really matter, in my opinion. Um, so I grabbed uh, a card from a uh, video game emporium, and I swiped it, and this is what was on it. Uh, it was a little obviously different. It didn't follow any of the patterns of the uh, restaurant um, or, or um, 
yeah, restaurants or mer merchandise stores or anything like that, it had these two distinctly different tracks. Track two had the account number. Track one had some weird code on it. So every time I went into this video game place and swiped my card and used it, track one would change, track two would remain constant. What I determined is track one is some algorithm determine the value of on the card. So if you had $20 on it, you swipe it, it would subtract. So it's reading and writing the card at the same time, which is really odd. Um, so then uh, I went and put a SQL injection on track one, yeah, equaling the card number. And that actually let me play unlimited games. So set the balance to 150, where card number equals the card number in track two. Track two is there. It sends track one back to the back end and just up and says the card has $150 on it. So it just kept, kept remaining valid. So, yeah. So here's some references if you guys are interested in um, learning more. So that, that Colnet is a place you can get cards. Just look them up online and just see the card numbers. Uh, the Script D uh, is another guy that did some research on mag strips, uh, mainly on the actual cards, the backs of them, uh, how they work. Uh, Krebs on security, clone cards and, and ATMs that came out uh, three three days ago. Um, Sam Rainenthaler actually helped me with some of this research out of DC 530 back home, and Adrian Pastor at Course Air. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can hit me up on Twitter, um, and this slide will be up next week on We Hack People. If you want to get a copy of the slide deck or uh, do get another walkthrough on it. And uh, yeah, that's it. I'll be up here with the MagStrip Rider if you guys want to check it out. And thank you.